In this video we're going to be looking at atoms and ions. In particular we're going to be focusing on a particular style of exam question where pretty much you have to describe why atoms form ions and you have to talk about their subatomic particles and whatnot. Here I've provided a sample question for you. I've got explain why the ions formed by potassium and sulfur both have the same electron arrangement and Typically this comes with a number of bullet points, so for example you've got to describe or define what an ion is, you've got to give atomic structures, and you've got to give the charges on each of the ions. Now in the bottom right hand corner I've got a set number of goals, and you'll see towards the end of this video what those goals are. So the first step to answering this question is to define or describe what an ion is, and the way to do that is pretty much learn a definition. I've got an ion is an atom or group of atoms um, that have lost or gained one or more electrons from its outer shell to form a full outer shell and to become stable or also carry a charge. Now this essentially is taken straight from the assessment uh, marking criteria from one of the past exam papers. The second thing that I would personally do when answering this question is to state the number of subatomic particles present in the atom. One of the examples that the question wanted you to talk about was to use potassium. So what you'll do is you look at the periodic table and you would see that potassium, symbol K, uh, has an atomic number of 19. So you would write down the potassium atom has 19 protons. Now I know it's 19 protons because the atomic number tells me the number of protons that are present. It also tells me how many electrons are present in the atom. If you are given a mass number, in this case I've given, given it to you as 39, then you can also work out how many neutrons there are. So you would just write the potassium atom has 39 minus 19 equals 20, 20 neutrons. Next thing I would do is to state the electron configuration of the atom. So using potassium as an example again, I would write the potassium atom has an electron configuration of 2881. Now you'll notice that I'm using commas here, I'm not using slashes or full stops or dashes or anything else. For some people it might be easier to actually draw the atom which is fine if that's a place where you want to start off with. So I've just included a key. Remember right in the middle I've got 19 protons and 20 neutrons. We worked that out in the previous step. Your first shell will hold 2 electrons and then your second shell will hold 8. Your third shell, um, later on you'll learn holds 18 but for our purposes we're going to fill it up with just up to 8. And then your final shell, put the rest of your electrons in there so we get 2 in the first shell, 8 in the second shell, 8 in the third shell, and 1 in the fourth shell. So that gives us 2881. Next thing I'll do is pretty much rinse and repeat steps 2 and 3, except this time for the ion. So this time I've got state the subatomic particles present in the ion. Just to recap from the previous step, I've got a diagram of the potassium atom there. And I can either choose to gain 7 electrons to form a full outer shell, or I could choose to just lose 1 electron to form a full outer shell. And it's going to be much easier for potassium to lose just 1 electron. We're going to have just the diagram as shown now where it's just losing 1 electron. And we have to update our diagram pretty much and call it the potassium ion. In words, you would write it as the potassium ion has 19 protons, 20 neutrons, and 18 electrons. Number five, next thing I'll do is to state the electron configuration of the ion, just like how we did it for the atom. So um, here's our diagram of the ion and the electron configuration. I've got two in the first shell, I've got eight in the second shell, and eight in the third shell. So that should give me 288. 
So I've got the potassium ion has an electron configuration of 2AA. On to the actual guts of the question, we're going to explain the charges on our ion. So for example, in potassium, we said that potassium has 20 neutrons, we said it had 19 protons, and we said that it had 19 electrons. Really important when you're explaining the charges that you mention that neutrons are neutral or they carry no charge. You mention that protons are positive and you mention that electrons are negative. After that, you need to say that in the atom, the positive charges of the protons and electrons pretty much cancel each other out to make the atom neutral so it has no charge. I'm going to do something really similar for the potassium ion. So again, I'm going to say it's got 20 neutrons, but I'm also saying they're neutral. I'm saying how many protons there are, so 19 positive protons, and I'm saying that it has 18 electrons. This time, I'm going to say that in the potassium ion, there is one more electron than protons. So this means that um, the positive and negative charges do not completely cancel out, and that means that my potassium ion should have a plus one charge left over. Last thing I'm going to do is to relate everything that I've written back to step one which you can see is to define or describe an ion. So just to recap we said that in step one we gave our definition of what an ion is. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that definition and I'm going to make it fit into my example for potassium. So we said that an ion is an atom or group of atoms that have lost or gained one or more electrons. So I'm going to say when the potassium atom forms an ion by losing one electron. And our definition again says that it's going to form a full outer shell to become stable. So the next thing I'm going to write is that after it's lost that one electron, it will have a full outer shell, it will be stable and it will carry a plus one charge. Uh, last thing I'm going to do is to pretty much repeat steps two to seven for any of the remaining elements in the question. Now just to recap, your first five steps are essentially mainly just achieved level criteria, they're just achieved level points. Once you get to about step six and get into the actual guts of the question, that's when you're getting into more depth and that will start scoring you some merits as well. Same with step seven when you relate it back to the definition of an ion. But step eight, essentially where you get your ease is if you can pretty much go around this cycle repeatedly and perfectly for all the atoms that are in the question. So just to recap, all the goals that you guys should be able to do, well, these are pretty much learning intentions. As you went through each step one to eight, you would have seen the number in the bottom right-hand corner being updated. All of these here are pretty much all the skills that that particular question is testing you on. So if you're having difficulty, it might be a good idea to go back to your textbook or to your notebook and just check that you can do number one, two, three, four, and just check them off your list.